The Mego Star Trek dolls of the 1970s with their vinyl Enterprise bridge playset are the stuff of legend, truly worthy of a place in any toy museum. Yet in the 1980s, the height of the action figure craze and the height of space adventure toys, Star Trek never found its footing on toy aisles, where Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, and Buck Rogers were synonymous with toys, the history of Star Trek toys in the 80s can best be described as a cosmic misfire. What the heck happened? The stage for Star Trek's far-flung fumble was set in 1979, when Mego got on board as the licensee for Star Trek The Motion Picture. This makes total sense, because they were behind the success of the original Star Trek toys. Mego also wisely made sure that the action figures for Star Trek were in the 3 and 3 quarter inch scale. Well played on Mego's part, because it matched the Star Wars figures that were so popular at the time. They even gave them the same five-point articulation. Unfortunately, the movie wasn't very toy-friendly. Dubbed by many fans as the motionless picture, the film suffered a series of bad decisions. After 10 years of waiting for the crew of the Enterprise to return, fans received a plottingly slow plot, a bald chick with a voice like a throat microphone, you are the cook unit. and Captain Kirk acting like an incessant jerk the entire time. Stop competing with me, Decker. I'm afraid you're going to have to double as science officer. I need you. I need him. Then why aren't you aboard? I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. Plus, everything was about units and orifices. The um, Decker unit can assist you with much greater efficiency. I believe the closed orifice leads to another chamber. I intend to calculate thruster ignition and acceleration rate to coincide with the opening of the beecher orifice. I have successfully penetrated the next chamber of the alien's interior. Nary a phaser was fired, nor a punch thrown. Add to that the lack of any tangible villain and costumes that gave every member of the cast camel toe, and you can see Migo didn't have a lot to work with going into this venture. The figures all look largely the same and they didn't come with any accessories. The villains in this line are just random Star Trek aliens that are quite rare today because of limited distribution. In what I suppose in hindsight is a serendipitous decision, Mego didn't bother to make Captain Decker look like actor Stephen Collins. Thank God. It's also odd that Mego didn't at least try to make the entire classic crew. Where are Sulu, Chekhov, and Uhura? Given that Decker and Ilea blink out of existence on a wind machine under a disco ball, there's little point to making figures of them if your film villain isn't a toy as well. Mego was falling behind other toy companies at this stage in the game, so their Enterprise bridge playset, while a fairly accurate impression of the movie set, was made of a flimsy molded plastic that cracked, tore, and yellowed quite easily. Sitting alongside the Star Wars playsets, it couldn't compare. The very same year, Mego was making the figures for the Buck Rogers in the 25th century. These toys were far and away superior in design and articulation to Star Wars figures, using the same construction that would be adopted by G.I. Joe in 1982. Maybe if Mego had given the Star Trek figures this level of articulation to trump Star Wars a bit, it would have helped sales. A little quality control would have been nice as well. This Ilea figure has legs with distinctly different lengths. As it is, they're just extra boring. Plus, Star Trek has always had another disadvantage on toy aisles. The lack of scalable vehicles for the figures to interact with. 
There are no tanks or personal fighters or anything. Because of that, the starships are always little die-cast toys or medium-sized plastic toys that don't accommodate the figures. And rarely did toy makers in the 1980s manufacture anything but the Enterprise. Very few enemy ships, and most of those were small die-cast versions. So consider that when you played Star Trek and you went to warp speed, you had to leave that bridge playset behind, stuff the figures from your away team into your pockets, then grab your Enterprise independently. With Star Wars, everyone piles into the Falcon and you go. Your figures can fight it out on the ground and then immediately fight it out in space. Star Trek was a different challenge altogether. I can hear the pretentious trolls now commenting, it's called your imagination. They love to throw out that comment as a defense for any toy line that gets criticized. Clearly, they are so superior in intellect, they need nothing to be satisfied. So I pose this question to the imagination trolls. Would Star Wars still be considered one of the greatest toy lines of all time if, in 1977, Kenner had made one single action figure? That's the entire toy line, Luke Skywalker. You had to use your imagination. I pretended this pen was Darth Vader, and this battery, R2-D2. It was the greatest childhood ever. I suspect not even the imagination trolls could admit this would have been a fun situation. So by that reckoning, there are standards, aren't there? My point is, there's a reason that some toy lines were more engaging than others, and we have to establish a common sense criteria by which to assess them. Otherwise, it becomes a slippery slope where imagination trumps all criticism, and this drinking glass becomes just as worthy a candidate for the Batcopter as the actual toy. There were very few Enterprise options. You might have had the small diecast version from Dinky, or you might have been fortunate enough to own the larger movie Enterprise toy from South Bend, made of all white plastic and complete with light and sound features. <laughs> and a display stand, the South Bend Enterprise was half toy, half display collectible. It could reconfigure thanks to removable nacelles into alternate anachronistic Starfleet ships, including one configuration that seems to predict the USS Reliant. Overall, it was an excellent toy replica of the movie Enterprise. So you land your away team, but Mego didn't provide any accessories like phasers or tricorders. And without any vehicles to fly or drive, these boring figures just stand around on this flimsy playset. Sadly, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, suffered the transgressions of the motion picture. Merchandisers were scared off after Mego took a bath on motion picture toys. Toy makers must have wrongly assumed that Star Trek II, like its predecessor, would have nothing exciting to make toys out of. Star Trek II was the most action-packed Trek movie of the original six films, but no Star Trek The Wrath of Khan toys were made in 1982. They didn't even license a die-cast Enterprise miniature in the U.S. In 1984, merchandisers jumped back on the Star Trek bandwagon to license Star Trek III. Taco Bell made collector glasses, and Ertl whipped up die-cast versions of the Enterprise, the Excelsior, and the Bird of Prey. At the same time, they made a small group of four carded action figures. Kirk, Scotty, Spock, and Krug. The figures had G.I. Joe-style construction, but really didn't reflect Star Trek III at all. Kirk, Spock, and Scotty were wearing the red Starfleet uniforms from Wrath of Khan, which only appeared very briefly in Star Trek III. And Spock certainly never wore a uniform in that film. In a way, Ertl was as close as we ever got to Star Trek II figures in the 1980s. So if you were fortunate enough to have the Mego Bridge, the South Bend Enterprise, and the Ertl figures, which would have been difficult since the former toys were from 1979 and the Ertl figures were from 1984, then you could have played in the Wrath of Khan universe. But Star Trek III wasn't as action-packed as Star Trek II, and the Ertl toys were neither made or sold in large numbers. So in 1986, when Star Trek IV came out, no toys came with it. Merchandisers must have seen the mega box office of Star Trek IV and unwisely rolled the dice again on Star Trek V. 
but those toys were more like display collectibles. They were figures that didn't move based on a film nobody liked. So merchandisers walked away when Star Trek VI came out, and their historical stupidity from Star Trek II repeated itself. Star Trek VI was directed by Nicholas Meyer, the man behind Wrath of Khan. The film was action-packed with phaser fights and starship battles. It won at the box office, but no toys were made. It seems merchandisers always backed the wrong horse in the Star Trek franchise. And because of their poor decisions, kids were denied a decent Star Trek toy line. What is the meaning of this attack? They must be from the mirror universe. No, we're from a better universe. We're taking your bridge. Why? Logically, the needs of the many Wrath of Khan fans outweigh the needs of the few motion picture fans. No, this is more my bridge than any of yours. Stop competing with me, Decker. Damn it, don't shoot. I'm a doctor, not a doppelganger. Spock, a shuttle has docked. A shuttle? But there isn't an available shuttle. A Klingon! A pedophile. Jim, a vampire! Haven't we met? 